And thank you so much for bringing us here together to rethink money. And if you heard all about the discussion this morning was how to get to uh, democratize money, one way is really through complementary currencies. And you can judge from the titles of the um, books that we've brought with us, if you want to have a look at uh, Occupy Money by Margaret Kennedy, um, which is creating an economy where everybody wins, or People Money, which she co-authored, with the promise of regional or complementary uh, currencies. And in fact, um, as Christine puts it, money is a method of representing and moving resources within a group. And this within is then how the resources are moved within the group. Margaret Kennedy would tell the monetary system that we have now continually redistributes wealth from the large majority to a small minority. And from that uh, diagnosis, she thinks there is a need to reoccupy money and through uh, complementary currencies. So we, um, I'm happy to welcome here uh, two lawyers, two economists, um, and, and two historians. We are only four, but um, they are so skilled that they really have um, each and every bit. So Helmut Zickmann is a living example, a concrete example, of the fact that you need history and law to understand economics and especially the nature of money. Helmut um, is then both a jurist uh, and, a, and an economist. He's a professor in Frankfurt. And he shapes the minds of the young generations, but also the constitutional law themselves, and especially in central banking. Helmut um, has um, many titles, so he's a professor, doctor, doctor, multiple <laughs> uh, honoris causa, and so on. Uh, we are uh, very happy to have you with us and especially you have brought something very uh, precious, which is a whole collection of uh, banknotes of uh, different kinds, uh, which will show you how, in fact, complementary currencies and multiple currencies was the rule and not the exception in the past. And we have Farley Grubb. So Farley is um, an economic historian also, uh, also both, and uh, Fowley has been, Grab is a um, professor in the Delaware University. He has been uh, looking into the era of America before uh, the revolution and after, and looking at the changes, it's first through international trade, including slavery, um, in labor, labor economies applied to history. And from trade, you naturally moved to money, which is the living blood of trade. Um, and then we have Isabel. Isabel Feichner is also a professor in law. Uh, she is um, in Würzburg. And uh, she worked before in a firm, in a law firm in New York. Isabel can tell you about mining asteroids. Uh, can you tell you about mining in the deep oceans, but today she will be down to earth uh, with us. Um, and uh, she's looking now at the complementary currencies and especially the German experiment with them, which is very successful with the Kimgauer. We also brought a few pieces of those complementary currencies and we're happy to have with us the founder of a local currency in Massachusetts, Susan Witt for the Berkshires, uh, together with Alice um, Maggio, who has been managing uh, the Berk Berkshires that are using the Berkshire country. Helmut, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Philippine. 
for your kind introduction and the kind words about my work. And thank you, Chris, very much for organizing this conference and for inviting me here to come to Harvard. Now I have to find uh, my, my presentation. So I'm, I'm only used to the, the Windows world and it's always a, a challenge to get used to an Apple computer. And um, so um, complementary currencies is not actually the, my, how come that this is uh, always on top? Okay, no, it disappeared. In uh, preparing this um, talk, I looked a little bit closer in complementary currencies because um, we have learned uh, during my, my studies of economics that there's something like Silvio Gsell, but didn't treat it further. And I've heard also about Kim Gower, about which uh, Isabel will give you more details, and, uh, and there was a paper a few years ago published by the Deutsche Bundesbank, and that also treated those local currencies, and we didn't use the term even complementary currencies, just local currencies, and uh, they kind of dismissed it as quantitatively uh, not really significant. But the, the interest is now growing, maybe because of the crisis and the, the aftermath of the crisis. And uh, at the moment, the interest in those um, in local currencies is, is growing. And when I tried to get into contact, I, I looked in, uh, on the internet, and um, there was a, a local municipal savings bank which allegedly would provide notes of the Chiemgauer. I called there, and then they, they asked and said, stay, stay on the line, and we, we, we tried to clear it. But after a longer time, they said, no, no, we are not going to send it to you. And so that's already demonstrated one of the problems of uh, getting hold of a local currency when you are not really living in the region. And uh, then um, I looked at the homepage, and I saw the, the, the manager of the, the uh, association uh, was, by the way, a, a French person living there, and uh, um, they had only altogether four opening hours during the week, and I had other things to do, so it was not so easy to get into contact, but with the, when I managed, and he was very, very polite and very helpful, so I joined the association, or a member of the association of the Chiemgauer, and, uh, and I also got a few days ago, I got them here, they are in real, so if you want to Look at them, I have already scanned them in, that's how they look like, and that's always something very good for a complementary curve. It's, there is something you can hold in your hand. And, um, but that also shows he was very eager, voluntary work, and, uh, and tried to convince me that this whole philosophy is really kind of the saving of many problems. And uh, so that's also a third uh, information I got from that, that uh, you need probably this kind of a conviction to keep something like that running. Now, let's, let's uh, come to the more academic details. First, a few words on terminology, not the, the usual uh, academic definitions, but uh, just a few con um, um, remarks. You all know this probably from the functional view of money. I don't want to go into and don't have the time to what is money and how to, de to define it. Um, that is probably better done by um, by, by um, Farley. Farley. I'm sorry. And what I also wanted to mention is um, also in contrast to what was discussed this morning, from the beginning on. on uh, and especially the research of Innes showed us that there has always been not only this, this uh, functional view the, that private persons get together and see, oh, it's more efficient to have money instead of water economy, um, that there has been probably from the beginning on some collectivistic view and that the, the intrinsic value even of coins was rarely equivalent to the nominal value. So there was always something additional to it. And, and some kind of, of society or 
government of an early type uh, that was behind it and to give it some credibility or whatever, maybe even for religious region, reasons. Now, what is currency? I thought, are um, complementary currencies really currencies? Because um, currency in our language quite often is something also uh, regulated by the sovereign, instituted by the sovereign, and whatever I could see at those complementary currencies, it was purely private organizations. So somehow that contradicts to the term currency, but the currency term has become quite wide. As you can see here, it, there is expansions, and so mm, one may, may go ahead and, and call complementary currencies really currencies, even though that somehow contradicts to the notion of a currency. Um, now, that's very important for me to show um, after looking in a lot of different um, of those products of the monetary systems, those notes from the beginning on, and we talk about banknotes, not about coins anymore, banknotes, that's my main interest, um, they have been always in the beginning a complement to real money, to monnaie courant, to to the coins, silver or gold, or even the, the copper coins. And uh, so uh, this uh, also is being watered down somewhat that there is a move to, to narrow down the concept. Not all parallel currencies are called uh, complementary currencies. It's more has become a technical term within those uh, circles, only these currencies on a local or regional level, and often demerge, I hope I pronounce it correctly, that means they, they lose value unless you to keep adding some kind of stamps to it. Here you see the, my main source, and it was already mentioned, this book by Margaret Kennedy and Bernard Litter and Jean Rogers. And so that's pretty com comprehensive on, on many of those currencies. They come to the result, legal tender, they don't want to replace it, just parallel. And that's where I came from, my research from parallel currencies, and that was more the, the present day problems, introducing a parallel currency in a more or less failing state like Greece, introduce a nea drachma parallel to the euro that would help them to solve the problems. I have my doubts. And then we have the book money created by banks. More than 90% of all money in a wide sense, in the functional sense of the word, is created by <coughs> financial institutions, basically banks. And then they say, no, we have a third category, complementary money, people money. And that's supposedly democratic. And now a short remark on democratic uh, representation and control. Um, it was a distinct decision after World War II in Germany not to have democratic money, no democratic control, because, and the majority of econo economists would probably agree uh, that politicians will destroy the monetary system. And there are some, a lot of instances in, in especially the Central European history where that has been done. A lot of research still is waiting because if you look into archives, not all of that is true. But often it's now contended um, an independent central bank that means not under the control of politicians, no democratic control, um, is better for the stability of a currency and helps by that way the poor people, they need it more than the rich people, a stable currency. Um, and that's why we had, from the founding days of the Bundesbank on, an independent institution. And the, our federal constitutional court, comparable to the Supreme Court in the US, said this is compatible with the principle of democracy. Well, that's a, a long, long discussion that has been going on, still going on. Now it's in the primary law of the European Union. Okay. Now we 
go on and uh, give you just a few examples about the heterogeneous origins of paper money. There are different routes. One is purely private. It was just receipts for depositing coins or precious metal, and that became tradable. And an important role played the uh, bills of exchange, not really money, but they substituted uh, coins for quite some time, very important for growth. And then, of course, we had also always rulers who printed and started printing money, notes, either immediately or by a bank they found it. And that was basically to get interest, to get a credit without paying interest. So there, as always, it uh, it's, would be not historically and legally correct to say there's just one strain of thought, there's just one source, it's, it's just uh, several that get together. It's complex, much more complex. And uh, here you see one example that was allegedly the first banknote in Europe issued by the Stockholm Bank. Now the next one was issued not by the bank, but was, was issued by the city of Vienna under great distress during the Napoleonic Wars. And that often happened. Here, the first uh, banknote, uh, allegedly, from France with the Banque Générale et Banque Royale, later on was renamed. You please correct me if I'm wrong. And that was disastrous, because they were just, as always, is the temptation, they printed much, too much of it, and a lot of, lot of people lost their savings. And the same happened about half a century later, with the assignat of the, of the French Revolution. And that is uh, very interesting from the legal point of view because that, those papers had some value in so far as they are where uh, letters of hypothèque of mortgages on the nationalized uh, wealth of the church and of the nobility partially too. That was worked in the beginning, people trusted it, and then they printed and printed and printed. And of course, it was wartime, and then later on it was worthless. Then they introduced mandat territorial, and that became worthless too. And what do rulers do when people don't accept paper money anymore? Then they give order to do that. And the draconian fines not to use this piece of paper. And that happened in France, and that's one of the reasons why banks in France don't uh, carry the name bank anymore. Here's a German uh, example, and that was also at a time when we had already a, a central bank, Reichsbank, and it issued bank notes, but there were no legal tender, and they didn't have the monopoly, and that was issued directly by the debt administration, and that was used like small paper money, small species of paper money. The Reichsbank was not allowed to issue uh, small denominations. Um, now, we come to my attempt to get a little bit of order into it. Um, some of those, uh, what I show is here an American example because the US accepted two attempts. First. Um, National Bank of the Second during uh, the colonial war, which was already shown here in the, uh, this morning, um, didn't have one until to, uh, 1913, allegedly also to finance the First World War. Here is an example from Germany. Uh, Württemberg, that's part of the German Empire, and they had kept the right to issue, issue bank notes and they were not private, and they were parallel to the Reichsmark. The denomination were the same, parallel to the banknotes issued by the Reichsbank. Interesting to go in details, but we don't have the time. I have to see that I can continue. Now I come to Silvio Gesell. He kind of is the grand grandfather of all the models of the now modern regional um, currencies. And what did he do to to uh, enforce um, that money should circulate, should not be hoarded. 
So he imposed, in his concept, it never became an official currency, of course, um, a, a fine for hoarding the money. You had to, to tear off one of those small denominations, Phoenix, and then paste them on this free money. That's what he called free money. And that's from his own publication. So in a way, that, that's genuine, that's original. Uh, I just uh, scanned it from his book, I own it. And here, later on, I already showed it to somebody. Um, that's later, uh, and I don't know how genuine that is, but I found it in, a, in an old book that I bought in a, in a bookstore. And, uh, and that's the same principle. That's his portrait on front and the back side. Again, he had to, to paste a little stamp every month to keep it valid. That's the, the principle which we all, all see also in, the, in modern times. And then in times of need, you have parallel currencies or complementary currencies. And need means like the hyperinflation in Germany in 1923. They couldn't even print enough money, so they imprinted 1,000 mark bill and, and imprinted 1 billion. So that was not even the, the top. It went un, uh, even until uh, uh, trillion. So what did the, the, the authorities do to help themselves? They issued complementary money. Here's one from the city of Cologne. Sometimes there's a cities. But that's legally, and it's written on it, Gutschein, whoever knows German, that's a voucher. They don't call it money, but it's circulated. And I thought it's interesting because it carries the, the signature of our later Chancellor Adenauer. He was at that time mayor of Cologne. Here's another one issued by a private corporation, parallel currency. And here's one, because I like that, that's from my hometown. Uh, uh, that's where I was born in Felwort. And this is legally different because this is not a voucher. How come? It is a check, legally a check. Not a bill of exchange, it's a check because it's drawn on the, legally drawn on the municipal savings bank, which is owned by the city. And that's a public law institution, but it's a bank. So that was possible to use this as a check. And all that was tolerated by the Reichsbank, by the central bank, because there was not was not able to provide the necessary um, species. Now, how did we come to, uh, to better times? Um, also a parallel currency, which is really uh, interesting for Germany, because uh, in 1923, they founded a new institution. And that issued um, a new currency and also a new denomination. And this was also legally st uh, structured like the assignat. It was more or less a, a letter on a mortgage on the national wealth. So it was correct what was said uh, this morning, that always the, the wealth of the population, of the people, is behind a, such a fiat currency um, and its credibility. And this was parallel, and it was no legal tender, but that helped. Instead of a billion, you, all of a sudden you had one Reichsmark. And then the Reichsbank continued to exist and issued new legal tender in a new currency, Reichsmark. The older currency was Mark. And that was parallel. So you had products of this Rentenbank parallel to the, the central bank. And, and it, it was accepted and circulated until the end. Here's one of a later issuance, and you see from the date uh, that that was uh, already during the time of the Nazi rule. Now, what is one of the, the prominent traits of the complementary currencies today is that you try to achieve another aim, another goal simply beyond simply using these banknotes as a mean of, uh, of um, payment. You want to foster something, the regional economy. You want to make unused resources into use to, to make the local economy grow. And, and there are 
examples from the US, instrumental use of the monetary system, I would call that. That's kind of a common trade of all the complementary currencies. Here, okay, you may have a look on it. Somebody wants customers to come to his, to his business, and we have many varieties of that type, like uh, also saving stamps, you put them in, in a book when you buy somewhere, and then it's also used like cash, because you can trade it in, could at the time when I was a boy, and got cash for it in the, in the official currency. Um, here's another one, an earlier Berkshire, I hope it's correct, I got that from the internet, I don't have a, a real specie of that time, here it is. And here, here are the modern examples, you brought some and I, I saw them already. And here's another interesting example, um, that's from Jersey, the states of Jersey. Jersey is part of the English crown system, I don't even know if it's part of the U United Kingdom, and they issue their own money. And there it is not instrumental, as far as I could find out, it's more to finance the local government. It extends the credit. It's interest-free credit for the local government. So that's also an interesting example for a parallel currency, not only a private emanation. And, uh, and here is the Chiemgauer, and I look at the watch, so I have to, here's the real currency, and you may touch it if you want. And uh, um, it's more to say, especially if you try to analyze problems and and, uh, and uh, benefits from those local currencies, but I have used my time already overused, I think, so I would like to give a hand over to Isabel, and uh, sh we uh, talked about the division of labor, so to say, and she is, um, on. she's, uh, she's, oh, you are the next, okay. But Isabel is talking more on the Chiemgauer, basically on their uh, legal, specific legal problems. I could say them from the European Union law uh, perspective, but I stop here in order to not overuse my time too much. Thank you very much. Fairly. Okay, I'm gonna talk from here. I don't have a slideshow. It's a theoretical paper, so you don't wanna see that. I'm gonna tell you what I'm about and what we're gonna do here. Basically, I'm narrowly focused on trying to understand British colonial American colonies and their creation of what I call inside monies or mediums of exchange that aren't gold and silver coins. And they faced a problem. They constantly complained about a scarcity of gold and silver coins, a scarcity of outside money, if you will, uh, in order to engage in local trade. And I'm going to try to explain that. Before I do that, let me say I'm a big bad economist. Um, I'm a Chicago economist, Chicago PhD, so I'm very much wedded to uh, that monetary tradition. You know, most of you may know this through Milton Friedman. I'm actually a, a Robert Lucas student of rational expectations uh, fame. Um, and so I'm kind of uh, hemmed in by economic models. But let me repeat here. An economic model is not reality. Uh, it's a model. The whole point of an economic model is to strip away a lot of the noise and a lot of the particulars of circumstance in order to see core forces at work that you have to deal with. But it's not reality. Now, unfortunately, a lot of my economist uh, friends uh, fall in love with their models and start to think of them as reality and whenever they see reality not matching their model, they deny reality. No, my model's true. You know, I can't be right. You know, and that's not how it should work. That produces ideology. The way it works is you got a model, you got these forces, you can't deny them, but the point is, is you look at your particular historical circumstances and you say, okay, now I gotta add back into this model what I need in order to see what's happening on the ground. And that's what I'm trying to do here. So I'm trying to take some very basic economic models that we can't deny, but also look at them critically and add back in some features that will end up getting us uh, local currencies, inside monies, things like that. So let me start with uh, um, um, British colonial America. 
Uh, and this really applies to kind of any polyity that has some constraints on it. So I think of colonies around the world through time, but it might also apply to smaller, smaller economies that are really being dominated by larger economies. Uh, so economies that really don't produce their own what I would call outside money. In this world, it's the money that's traded with between countries, and that's gold and silver coins. So British North American colonies didn't possess gold and silver. They didn't mine it. They could only bring it in through imports. Um, and so they weren't allowed, and they also weren't allowed by the British Crown to mint coins. So they really couldn't produce their own money that was used to trade with internationally. So they're constrained by that. And they're also constrained by not being able to create something that they can really hold in a fixed exchange rate with that outside money. So one of the conditions is that whatever they do, there's no fixed exchange rate with specie coins on the outside because they don't have any ability to defend that. The other thing is they don't have it, uh, or they're not allowed to really engage in uh, capital trade controls in order to control the inflow and outflow of specie money into their economies either the parent company or country, Great Britain. Blame everything on Great Britain. They did everything wrong. Anyway, um, wouldn't allow them to do this, or for other reasons, they don't engage in these kind of controls. In that sense, we want to ask the question, how then can this country maintain enough of this outside money, in this case, gold and silver coins imported, to do local transactions, as opposed to it flows back out, and they're left with nothing. Now. The problem I run into when I read the colonial history is the colonists always talk about chronic species scarcity. They don't have enough gold and silver coins to execute local transactions. When you read through this, it is ubiquitous and overwhelming. I went through a lot of literature, and it is, it is just overwhelming how often they're saying, we just don't have this, and we have to revert to some kind of other media of exchange or, or direct barter of some type. Um, there are some others who claim, no, that, that's a myth. That just that doesn't happen. These people are crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. Most of those are economists who say that, who don't like the reality of what they're reading. But there are some colonials that say this. So let me explain where the controversy comes from. We want to explain how is it possible to have chronic species scarcity in a world where you don't have any trade controls, where there's open arbitrage of value. Um, in that kind of world, in a simple economic model, species should flow in, prices are going to adjust, and you're going to have enough species to trade with. There should never be chronic species scarcity. Now, this basically comes from a very simple quantity theory of money story and quantity theory of money um, um, uh, species flow mechanism for an outside, outside economy uh, that really produces a world where chronic species scarcity is impossible. You can never be scarce on money. The way that works is quantity theory of money, very simply in a closed economy, what you end up with is that uh, uh, the growth rate of money matches the growth rate of prices pretty closely. And that's because output and velocity are, are severely constrained by real factors. And in a nutshell, that's the quantity theory of money. You know, and it's hard, it's hard to, to deny that. Uh, in a species flow mechanism, when you're looking at the outside, so you've got a quantity theory of money, but you also import and export money. So if you have a local money, like a banknote money, that you hold in a fixed exchange rate to that outside money, the gold and silver, the quantity theory of money still works. You know, as long as it's held in a fixed exchange rate, it still works. As you have more money, uh, as the growth rate of money goes up, prices are going to go up, and that's going to that's going to reduce the inflow of money and bring you back to an equilibrium. So, if you if you just take that at face value. You can't have chronic species scarcity, and in fact, you can't have monetary scarcity at all. You can have trade disruptions, you can have shocks, but at the end of the day, I mean, there are tides, there are storms, but sea level is sea level everywhere. That's what the quantity theory money gets you. Now, the problem is then, if we take the colonists seriously, and there's chronic species scarcity, we got a problem. Either the th you know, theory isn't telling us everything we need to know. We need to do something to it to match the reality, as opposed to deny the reality and just say we believe in the quantity theory of money. So what I do in this paper is I say, OK, let's look closely at the quantity theory of money. There are two important assumptions that I think we have to get rid of in order to understand why we get local scarcity of an outside money. The first one is the quantity theory of money assumes that all transactions are monetized. 
So once you get rid of that, once you say there are some transactions that take place that don't use money, uh, that are some kind of trade, then you kind of open the hole. You, you break the equation of exchange identity and you have an opening for some kind of, um, if you want, local, local alternative. Um, the way I phrase this is all money mediates exchange, but not everything that mediates an exchange is money. You can have real goods mediating an exchange. You can have bookstore credit mediate. You have lots of things mediating the exchange that doesn't look like the, quote, real money, mm -hmm. which people refer to as gold and silver coins here. So once you do that, you open the door. The second thing I think I need is, is you need a condition of poor import substitution. Uh, so you need a, an underdeveloped local economy that really can't produce something that has um, or has a high elasticity of substitution with what they can import from the outside. The way to put this is, there's some goods on the outside I really want, and there's nothing local that will take its place. I want to drink Madeira wine, goddammit, and the beer we're producing here is crap. So I'm going to import Madeira wine. How do I do that? I need real money. I need that outside money, and that's what I'm going to do. And the minute I buy that Madeira wine, the outside money leaves the economy, and it's not in the local economy to further trade for other transactions. So I need these two conditions. Not all trade is monetized, and there's uh, underdeveloped or poor import substitution. Once I do that, even under the assumption that outside money, gold and silver coins in this case, have a lower transactions cost in trade than any alternative, any alternative barter or book credit or inside promissory notes or anything like that, even if I maintain that assumption, I can produce um, an outcome where as long as there's some efficiency in what I call barter transactions, this might be like book credit transactions at a local store where you can have cross clearing of accounts. As long as I can produce something like that, I can produce a condition where in that local economy, if I have gold and silver coins, it's to my advantage to buy the import good and ship it out of the economy. And I'll resort to that local barter transaction to do my local exchange. That, thus we get chronic species scarcity. We don't have that species to trade locally because I'm always buying import goods for it. And then I show that under that kind of condition, this is suboptimal in terms of welfare optimality. The reason for that is the gain I get by being able to buy buy that, that import good, um, I'm looking at that gain for myself. I don't consider the loss everyone else in the economy has by having a less efficient way of trading by not having that gold and silver coin anymore, that they have to go resort to book credit or something like that. So that produces a, a condition where we're going to have chronic species scarcity. The outside money is not going not to be around to use, and we have a suboptimal outcome because we're all relying on some kind of endogenized media of exchange of some type, promissory notes, book credit, things like that. The last thing I do is I go through and I say, okay, suppose we can make whatever this barter transaction method, inside money method, as efficient as we can. Still not as good as having the outside money, but we can make it pretty, pretty efficient. And I, in the colonial economy, I kind of term this as when colonial legislatures start printing uh, bills of credit that circulate more generally within the whole colony rather than just around a specific store or around a specific group of promissory individuals. So there's a little more efficiency in a, or a lower transactions cost to using that. If that lowers the transactions cost enough, even if it's still above the outside money, if it lowers it be below the transactions cost of the outside money and the opportunity cost loss of using that outside money to buy imports, then we can produce an optimal social welfare outcome. It becomes optimal to ship that outside money out and buy those imports and use this inside local money, in this case, colonial bills of credit, to do your local transactions. And that becomes welfare superior to the alternative. And so it's kind of an evolutionary scheme where you end up saying, we start developing um, we, we keep economizing on our transactions cost of trade so that I'm not walking door to door with a pig under one arm looking for someone with a box of candles to trade with. 
That's very costly. We find more efficient ways to do this by having, again, centralized trade around local stores or promise. We find some efficiency. Once we start doing that, it becomes beneficial to not use our outside money for local trade, but to buy those imported goods with it. Um, uh, Adam Smith recognized this a long time ago when he was talking, uh, talking about, uh, gee, if we could only use that outside money to buy our imports rather than locking it up in local trade, wouldn't that be welfare enhancing? And we could use something else for local trade. Um, so I'm looking at that hierarchy as I kind of move down and find more and better ways of economizing on those transactions costs. And they finally get to a point where uh, uh, they'll have an inside local money that will basically serve as their, as their uh, method of trade. The key to all this modeling is really the gap between how efficient this, whatever this inside barter, local inside money trading mechanism is, and the opportunity cost loss of not using the outside money to buy imports. It's that gap that draws this. You can eliminate chronic species scarcity then um, uh, primarily by developing the economy so that you have better import substitutes. In fact, if you get to the point where you have perfect import substitutes, the opportunity cost of using specie to buy local goods goes to zero. And so you never need to export it. You can buy local goods, you don't have to buy imports. Two minutes. Um, and so it really comes down to the fact that, that we got economies that are underdeveloped in their ability to produce the goods that they really want to buy that can only come from the outside. Now, at least in the American case, one of my interpretations then of this, of what uh, the US does once they get rid of the British, once we get rid of the British, we can do all sorts of things. Uh, one is to have our own tariffs. <laughs> so the Hamiltonian tariff, everyone interprets that in certain ways. My interpretation is what they're doing is they're trying to raise the or they're trying to lower the opportunity cost of using specie to buy local goods. And thus they can maintain an internal specie money supply because they need to do that because they're gonna have a banknote system that they wanna hold banknotes in a fixed exchange rate to specie. They can't have specie flowing out. So they need, they need to eliminate, eliminate that uh, opportunity cost gap. And you do that by, in this case, raising tariff prices, making those foreign goods a lot more expensive than local goods. One minute. Thank you. No, done. <laughs> Thank you. So Isabel is going to discuss the paper of Farley Grub and uh, then tell us about the Kimgawar uh, currencies and some legal aspects uh, to uh, having complementary currencies yeah. in Europe. Yes. Uh, We'll have time for questions after, uh, after the presentations. Unless you have questions just for clarity that you wish to ask now. Is there any question to uh, Farley? Yes? To make this small. Yeah, I tried that already. Oh, maybe oh, you have to go down no somewhere. Yeah, we just policy. go ahead. So I'm wondering why, I admit this is going further, but since there is mm. a, okay. why is it, model that you can that see yeah. Make this big somewhere. Right. I think the uh, uh, one thing is uh, you wish to get the confidence of the people within the in the currency. So you back them by the legal tender currency, and this is in that sense that they are complementary to the legal tender currencies and not parallel. Um, so you can introduce parallel currencies as in what uh, Farley described for the U.S. colonies, or at the time in Germany, um, as uh, Helmut w was describing. But if you, if you want to kick, kick up, st start um, a new currency uh, locally, 
Um, now with the legal framework we have, we need to back them by actual dollars or actual euros, right? So, uh, and then the uh, easiest is to back them one-to-one -one and have a one-to-one -one exchange rate. And so you get the confidence uh, through that and you get into the legal for, uh, framework uh, as well. One second, I, I think part of it is the colonies just didn't have the capability to do that. So that's one reason they didn't. I don't think it was a design plan. It's just they couldn't. But I guess I was asking about the design plan, right? Because if you back them one to one, I don't think how you can actually stimulate the local economy. Oh, that, yes. So that really, well, indeed. The whole point is you make, you make it circulate within the community. That's where it's accepted. So your lo local currency that has, um, we can estimate, will have a velocity which is sometimes eight times higher than the velocity of the actual dollars or euros. Um, so you increase velocity by increasing the transactions. And this is why you have demerage, for instance. So you want the, the currency, you make it extra to lose its value, as in Silvio Gesell's ID. Um, so people are incentivized to use it and do not save it. So it's not a, nothing for a store value or for speculation or, or for savings. It's really coming back to the first function of money of means of pay, using it as a means of payment. And by making it circulate in the economy, you multiply the transactions um, and you incentivize the one who receives your currency to also use it locally because it cannot go outside with it. And in that way, you increase the potential of the um, of the community. <clears throat> you, Isabel. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, I should maybe first say that I just started a research um, project and on the democratization of money and um, credit. And part of that research project is also um, looking at and conceptualizing complementary currencies. So I don't have any research findings to, to show for yet. So that's why I agreed to comment on Fali's paper and then give a broad overview on the objectives and design of complementary or community currencies, as they are also called. And then maybe just very briefly touch on some legal problems. So I won't spend much time on the, on the Chiemgauer. Uh, sorry. So I'll start with my, my comment. So Fali Grubb's paper begins with a critique of economists' conception of money as a particular medium of exchange. Their definition of money, Fali says, is too broad. The definition of barter too narrow. Moreover, he criticizes economists for conflating money and medium of exchange. What is money then for, for Fali? Money, according to the paper, is a thing that has a particular utility for ex executing transactions. We might call this utility, I believe, um, liquidity or, as he does, the transaction premium. Fali says we may or should separate the money part of a thing from the non-money part of a thing. We may identify the money part counterfactually by asking if this thing is not used as money, what would its value or barter price be in a pure Valrasian arrow de Breu general equilibrium? If the counterfactual barter price was the same as the price we observe, then there is no money component in the good. According to Fali, moneyness is thus determined by the willingness to pay for the liquidity it provides, in Fali's terms, for its transaction cost premium. This raises the question how we may objectively determine the value of a thing if valuation depends on the existence of money, as some argue, if money is the form that value takes in economics, then moneyness cannot be determined by some value external um, to money. Where does the unit of account come from? We might also ask, ask in which we can express our willingness to pay if not from money. So let's return to the paper's concept of money. Fali proposes how things that mediate exchange begin to take on moneyness value beyond their pure barter goods value becomes the interesting question to study. 
So they might take on moneyness value until ultimately we end up with pure fiat monies, namely things that are all that are all moneyness value with no real barter goods value to them. So that's a quote from the paper. So much for the abstract description of money in the paper. Concretely, there appear to exist two real monies, he mentions. So the just mentioned fiat paper money is one of the real monies, as well as specie money. Specie money for Fali are all silver and gold coins, be they gold Spanish pistoles or gold English crown. What he calls inside monies for him are rather barter arrangements with different degrees of efficiency, but not real money. Several questions arise for me with respect to this inside money. If government issue tradable debt instruments that were used as a means of payment are not money, but only have the money part, what is the non-money part of these instruments? And what, by contrast, turns specie money into real money? What is the reason for the transaction premium of specie that is always higher, according to Fali, than that of inside money? So you might remember, Fali just explained to us that the transaction cost of using specie is always lower um, to the transaction cost we incur when using inside money. According to Fali, the use of specie always involves less transaction costs than the use of inside money. This is the premise in which his whole model is built. But why should this premise be accepted? Fali's explanation once more turns on value. I quote, outside monies are monies that lose little value when crossing polity borders, either because they have some universal commodity value at their core, or because a defended and believable fixed exchange rate exists between that money and other outside or other polity specific monies. So the value they don't lose when crossing borders is their transaction premium, their liquidity. But why is this value now defined in terms of commodity value when earlier in the paper the term commodity money was critiqued as an oxymoron? We were asked to distinguish between the commodity part of money on the one of the thing on the one hand and the money part of the thing on the other. Later in the paper, Fali explains why also the cost of using specie, the real money, in transactions is not zero. Costs inter alia arise from identifying counterfeit coins, from determining what specie coins have been debased, clipped, or otherwise reduced in value. Uh, costs arise from determining the value of a Spanish pistol compared to an English crown. I wonder then, given all these potentially very significant costs, why the transaction cost of using specie should always be lower than the transaction cost of using inside money. I also wonder if not the moneyness of specie is better explained by reference to some kind of agreement or legal arrangement which transcends the borders of the colony. The fact that inside money loses, and again, I again quote, loses a substantial value when crossing polity borders, quote end, as Farley writes, would also plausibly be explained with reference to a collective agreement or to some legal arrangement, in this case one that only encompasses the polity or the community that has created the inside money. So this brings me to my last question. How does or does the legal design of inside money matter? It's very clear from Farley's description of inside monies that these are creatures of law, that they are products of collective design. Yet how does this design matter, even though the design is described of efficient barter and enhanced efficient barter, um, I cannot really see how it matters to Farley apart from affecting the elasticity of the money supply, the quantity of money. So my final question thus is whether the paper leaves us with but a slightly modified quantity, th quantity, th quantity theory of money, one that takes account of limits to tradability as well as of the moneyness of inside monies. So in the end, it seems that you suggest that while economists have a too um, broad definition of money, the quantity, quantity, quantity theory of money has a too narrow um, view of money. 
I also ask myself whether Fali proposes to us a concept of money that, like the Valrasian model, regards value as an inherent property of commodities, thus a concept that does not subscribe to an institutionalist conception of money as proposed, for example, by André Orléans, which understands money as the form that value takes as making valuation and thus market exchange possible. So, after these comments, I now turn to complementary um, contemporary complementary currencies, their design and objectives, and I focus on the so-called community currencies. These community currency initiatives demonstrate very clearly that money is a product of collective design and that design matters. Through the design of its complementary currency, the collective may affect, for example, who is included and who is excluded as an economic actor, how the economic product is distributed, what kind of economic de development is being promoted. So I'm looking at the following objectives of complementary currencies, which go beyond facilitating payment, um, economic development and sustainability, democratization of money and credit, changing valuation and transforming um, political economy more general, generally. Um, so economic development and sustainability is an objective pursued by a number of regional monies, one example being the Kimgawa. The Kimgawa being an, a regional money issued by a non-profit organization. It can be purchased with euros at an exchange rate of one to one. And Kimgawas ex are accepted by regional businesses that are members of the organization. And these businesses can convert Kimgawa back into euro, but at a loss of 5%. And 3% of these 5% are then donated to social project projects um, designated by participants in the Kimgawa um, initiative. The Kimgawa, as Professor Siegmann just mentioned, um, loses value if not spent or revalued th through stamps that can be purchased. So it's so-called script money. And through the Kimgawa then, local production and consumption shall be promoted because your Kimgawas you can only spend um, at regional businesses, which um, accept the Kimgawa and two if, which, if they don't want to um, exchange them back into um, euro at a loss, have then to also spend these Kimgawas regionally. Um, income which the Kimgawa organization makes is used to support local, social, and envi environmental projects. And there's also a, a small credit function. This credit function is, um, is larger or more extensive as concerns the OISCOS, that's a regional money in the Basque country. There, the euros uh, which are spent purch purchasing and guaranteeing the OISCOS are deposited with a financial cooperative, le NUF, that then extends social finance. So the initiative seeks to produce um, the additional benefit of providing social credit to some quite extensive um, um, amount uh, or, yeah, extend social cre credit um, on a much larger scale than the Kimgawa organization can. So my third example then is the Zadex, that's a business-to-business -business electronic complementary currency, so merely electronic while OISCOS and Kimgawa issue um, notes, that is merely a mutual credit system, so that corresponds to what in Fali's paper was um, the efficient barter system of mutual credit arrangements. And that initiative seeks to enhance access to credit for regional Sardinian small and medium enterprises. Um, I come now um, to the second objective, democratization of or through uh, money and credit. So a number of complementary currency initiatives also aim at democratizing money or to employ money to democratize um, society and the economy. And I would like to distinguish between three dimensions. So the first is the collective participatory design of the currency. So for example, take the um, Kiemgauer, there has been a collective design process regarding the organization rules, and that process is also ongoing, so the rules could be changed by 
collective agreement. The second dimension is the aim to reduce inequality as a threat to democracy and to strengthen social cohesion. So here again, the SADEX could um, be referred to as an example, which seeks to reduce inequality and strengthen social cohesion also across regions in, in Italy. And the third dimension then would be the aim of empowerment and inclusion of groups otherwise excluded from economic and political participation. Here we might refer to the MACI as an example, um, which is an initiative um, in East Amsterdam. Uh, one MACI corresponds to one hour of community service. So here you even have your own unit of account, which you don't have with respect to Oiskos and Chiemgauers. And this um, MACI, can then be redeemed for products, services, or discounts at local stores. And also there you have a, um, the rules and design of the initiative are developed in a participatory process involving municipality, local businesses, and civil society. So then I turn to the objective of changing valuation. So if money is the form that value takes in economics, um, if money allows us to make objective valuations, so not just our individual, but intersubjectively recognizable valuations, for example, through determining people's willingness to pay, for example, for the conservation of certain species in the deep sea, then it becomes tempting to try to transform valuation through a different monetary design using a different unit of account. So one example of complementary currencies attempting to do this um, are time-based credit monies. They are not linked to the euro, like the Chiemgauer or the Oiskos, but rather their unit of account expresses real labor time, so not the socially adequate labor time, but real labor time that went into production of a good or provision of a service. Another example are energy monies that strive for money to express energy production and consumption. So one representative of such an energy money uh, proposal or of such proposals was um, Douthwaite. He argued that money production should be linked to energy production. Um, at the same time, he envisaged um, energy production to be reformed. So communities should, for example, produce their own energy and use this as a basis for issuing a local currency. So you can imagine a currency in form of energy credits instead of tax credits that circulate as means of payments and can be used to redeem your energy bill. I want to conclude this part by pointing more generally to the potential of monetary design to transform political economy. Chris um, has impressively shown um, in her work um, on the Bank of England, but also with respect to the transition from early American paper money uh, to what she calls modern money, how monetary design can transform political economy. So with respect to the colonialist paper money, she writes, colonial legislatures decided when to issue money and how to retire it. Local constituencies approved and disapproved the results. Political authorities working with an involved public appropriately created the medium. As each holder accepted a credit and every taxpayer cooperated in the practice that retired bills, all could appropriately claim benefits from that common fund. The image, ima, imagery used, um, um, as described by Chris, was blood. And if we look at today's initiatives, it's interesting, I think, to see this imagery recurring. So money, like blood, many of these initiatives claim um, should reach all parts of the organism should be provided by the collective for the benefit also of the weakest part of society. By contrast, modern money um, could be conceptualized, um, and again I quote, as a medium subsidized by the public and produced by investors. A money creation um, which is based on profit expectations with respect to individual enterprise, the benefit for society being much more indirect in that the profit accruing to individual investors, so to part of society, may maybe someday trickle down to the rest of society. I conclude. Is there time? Otherwise, I could just leave, a, leave out this part. Yeah, yeah, one minute. Okay. So 
many, many legal issues arise with respect to complementary currencies, so I just really focus on very few. So complementary currencies have existed for a long time. In Germany, we can say that it's really a gray area. They, they so far have not been real um, legal or successful legal challenges. But sometimes it's, it's discussed whether, especially if, um, or whether the issuance of paper notes, these are vouchers in the case of the Chiemgauer, whether that would uh, violate uh, paragraph 35 of the central bank um, law, which penalizes the issuance of unauthorized monies that may be used as means of payment instead of legally authorized coins and bills. The objective of this norm is to protect monetary sovereignty. It's a legal gray area because, yeah, there has been no such prosecution which has been successful, and there probably won't be any as long as these currencies have such limited regional reach and are economically considered as insignificant. But it's still interesting to juxtapose this situation in Germany with the one in France, where in 2014 a law on the social and solidarity economy, economy was passed, which explicitly recognizes um, local monies when they um, conform to certain conditions, like they must be issued by a social and solidarity economy organization, which must be inter alia democratically governed. Um, many complementary currency initiatives want the municipal municipality get involved either by accepting payments, for example, if you go to your local swimming pool, that you could pay in complementary currency, and also by making payments in complementary currency. That has also raised certain um, legal questions. So the Brixton pound, that's a mistake on the slide, it should be the Brixton pound, they very closely work together with the Lambeth Council of South London, very successfully, the municipality accepts payments and also makes payments in um, the Brixton pound. Um, the Chiemgauer has not been successful. Reference has been made to the principle of budget discipline. It's been said that if we have a script money which loses mel value, that makes the municipality maybe spend the money even though they would not otherwise spend the money that would violate the principle of budget discipline. Um, yeah, there are some maybe guidelines how you could bolster legality if you wanted your community currency be accepted as means of payment by the municipality. So it should be ideally, that's the case with the Brixton pound, be convertible um, back into uh, pound or euro. Um, expenditure should be made via small contracts so you don't come into conflict with the public procurement um, law. And in the case of the use oiskos, a legal um, dispute could be resolved by saying that the municipality would pay oiskos to an intermediary, which would then disperse the oi So payments are made in euro, and the intermediary then disperses the oiskos to the recipient of the payment. OK, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fale, would you want to uh, answer? You have some minutes um, on the comments. and A uh, couple seconds. Um, how do you determine the moneyness of a money thing when it's money? Um, it's a simple answer to that. In economics, value only has meaning relative to something else. It's all relative value. I can only measure the moneyness of inside monies because I have to use the outside money as the benchmark which means I cannot use this model to measure the moneyness of an outside money. I, I need a benchmark, I need something to compare it against. So I can only do it for inside monies, and that's the nature of economics. We need a relative, relative benchmark. Um, in terms of uh, uh, why isn't the transaction's cost to specie greater than efficient barter, uh, it, it may well could be at some point. I don't model it that way because it's a modeling convention where I don't want people to point at me and say, oh, you assumed your result. So if I modeled it such that inside money was more transactions cost efficient than outside money, people would say, oh, you just assumed your result. So I need to show the development of this even in relation to that difference. So it's not saying it doesn't, isn't possible, it's just that I can't do it in order to do that. But if the moneyness is higher than the moneyness, oh. Well, anyway. Anyway, so, so two short answers. <laughs> Can this discuss later. Just a, a few words. Um, 
on whether we can really complement with complementary currencies, whether we can really strengthen um, regional development. And um, I want to take examples of uh, the US as well. Uh, we were speaking on a, a lot about the Eurozone and about history. Um, we, we know uh, the upheavals, uh, the political upheavals, uh, because of some regions feeling left behind, uh, like the Midwest, of course, or in France, you see the uh, people putting on the yellow jacket to demonstrate in Paris and say, don't leave us behind in the provinces of France. Or you have um, the left behinds um, in the, during the euro area crisis of the periphery country. So it's a whole, whole question about periphery versus the um, central, um, often financial or metropol metropolitan areas. And the story um, we see in um, every people's mind when looking at complementary currencies, but very often this is not shown uh, with data. Um, and I want to take a, a macro look uh, to, uh, to show you how important that is. Uh, and then um, before coming to a more micro uh, level, of making a case for complementary currencies. And if we have um, here, if we look at the payment flows within the US, we can register them. We don't have balance of payments as we have in Europe between the various countries, but we have the Fed wire payment system of the US Federal Reserve, which shows net payment flows between the 12 districts of the 12 reserve banks. And what happens here is that before the 2008 crisis, you had um, the flows were in net terms uh, quite uh, zero, right? They, they were quite neutral, but with the financial crisis, you jumped to very high numbers of net payment flows. What does it mean is if you take New York, which is represented in red, you had in net terms more money coming into the New York district than it was leaving the New York district. The reason why you see sharp uh, downturns uh, on the left-hand chart is because these net payment flow imbalances are settled once a year in the accounts of uh, the, reserve, the Federal Reserve System. So they are offset by some changes in the uh, shares in, in the pool of assets held in the SOMA accounts. But this is an accounting offsetting, right? The reality we need to recover from the data, and the reality is really money going out of the Midwest, say, and uh, the periphery of the country towards the financial center in very large numbers. Um, so this is what I, I do on the right hand chart with uh, the... Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, so, if you, if you look at the uh, payment flows, which were quite neutral before, um, then the red part here for New York, assuming no settlement, um, is increasing, increasing uh, towards some 7% of the US GDP. Um, meaning at the time, that's 2014, after, after which the uh, quantitative easing was uh, stopped, right? Um, around a third of the liquidity injection through the Federal Reserve went back to New York. Um, well, how was this quantity, um, this um, liquidity injection made? That was to the whole country, for instance, by purchasing mortgage-backed securities, right? So you help or you support the weaker parts of the economy in all over the country by um, subsidizing, in a way, mortgages, real estate everywhere. But in net terms, it came back to the financial center. 
And we have very, very much the same story in the Eurozone, where um, all the money was injected mainly through uh, the periphery for the Greek banks, the Italian banks, Spanish, and so on, which had problems. But in their terms, through the, the payment flows in the real economy, the money was coming back to Germany or Luxembourg, so to the financial centers. So we have an illustration of what we're, we're telling the, this morning about the financialization um, go, going on, and especially with the central bank having a lot of responsibility uh, there. In trying to fight the crisis, they saved the financial system, but they also really put a, a lot of um, help to the financial system itself. So that's for a macro um, perspective. Now we can give at the micro level, uh, we can look at how we should help enhance welfare through uh, a complementary uh, currency. Um, very, very simply, like with Farley, we have to assume away, um, not assume away the problems of uh, neoclassical economics. So you should not look at maximizing your own welfare. You always think, when you think about complementary currencies and introducing them, you think about the community. Like at the macro level, you think about the periphery, not about the center itself. At the micro level, you think about your welfare, you will maximize it if you, will, you maximize, say, your consumer surplus, or i told we are rather citizens and consumers this morning, um, with a certain share. One minus alpha, plus you care for the community, so the average surplus in the community for a certain share, alpha. You can call this, um, th so this is this alpha times the average share in the community, um, which is different from all the macro models. And you need that. You need this thinking about um, the community and the welfare in the community to motivate at the micro level uh, the introduction of uh, complementary currencies. So you can call this alpha simply altruism, or you can call it an aversion to inequalities in your community, or you can simply look at a recognition that your own well-being depends on the well-being of your community. And I would go even further and say, um, you think about yourself even, but through time. And say when you retire, you still want to go to the baker at the corner of the street, so you'd better uh, go and buy from him or from the local bookstore rather than from Amazon in the first place. So through time, it's also foresight. The degree of foresight is given by this uh, alpha. So um, now we can, on that, from that basis, consider the chain of spending individuals. And in the first step, if an individual spends without caring for where he spends, say just get books on Amazon, um, he doesn't make any effort to select the local shops and local goods then the propensity rises that the next individual in the chain will be off uh, the job market, right? He will lose his job and leaves off public aid. And however, if the first person selects the local um, goods, then the next individual is more likely to uh, maintain his job and spend, spend his earnings as he likes, which we have, we can simply illustrate in this chain of uh, decision tree. Should I spend locally? No, I don't bother. Then I have what you have in your model as with the low transaction costs, you have the highest surplus. You can buy all the import goods or, um, at low cost. But then the next person, say, is off the job market and all the rest behind, right? In a way, that's Midwest, right? The Midwest, sorry. Or, yes, I make the effort to spend locally. And then the next person, so myself, I have maybe a consumer surplus in the first step, which is lower. But I allow the next person to have the same choice. And he can 
choose to consume locally as well, or it doesn't, and then all the rest is off the job market. But if he consumes locally and so on, all the rest will do. So you want, with your complementary currency, to be in that part of the tree. Um, since you maximize is you'll take the uh, economies you want to maximize welfare, you have certain uh, conditions depending on your degree of altruism, alpha, depending on the relative shares of consumer surplus between those living of public aid. So if public aid is very high, then um, it's not so bad to have it. Uh, depending on what you get, if you just import or buy on Amazon, and depending on what you, you the surplus you get from going to the local shops. And what the local currency does, the complementary currency, is simply, so I, I will not go through the, through the, the mass or, or so, but um, it is simply that you lower the opportunity cost of making the effort to find the local shops or think about who should I give my money to so that I'm incentivizing him to also spend on local goods. And so in that way, you increase this area. Um, so for those who have seen Farley Grab's paper, you, you would also uh, see the, the charts inspired by him. Um, you increase the surplus relative to the surplus of not doing that. Um, and that is in which way the, the, the uh, local currency hub in its strengths in bringing the uh, economy to work regionally and, and strengthening it. Now, um, I want to uh, close with some misconceptions regarding complementary currencies. Uh, you have some usual counter arguments to them. Are they legal? So we've heard, right? Uh, to make them legal, sometimes you have to call them butchers in Germany. <laughs> Um, or you have to have special rules that we had at first. Um, maybe you, uh, in the Berkshire, had to do some, some, some legal defects. I, I don't know the details about that. Um, but it, it's, it, there is always an issue. Um, are, they, are they legal? And from the central bank we're working on, um, the, this is something we regard as. not lose it, or we should just disregard them as something uh, not um, important. Not important, not important. It's not the truth. Um, Bernard Litter, if I may, who uh, also calls it, who was counting the complementary currencies in something like um, quite a few, just a few, in the 1980s. And then um, before the crisis, the financial crisis, some five Um, and after the financial crisis, about 10,000 dollars currencies. The idea is you start small, Bill Gates also started small, and then you get, uh, you may hope to have something bigger. But how to make those bigger lies with the appropriate legal framework. And there we are back um, to having the lawyers here. We also need the historians to tell us, hey, this was not the exception. means of payment only sometimes, although it serves many objectives, but you indeed um, kill any speculation of quality. Right? All the incentives are, are there. But yes, the most fungible money is it. But that's exactly what we want. The same, the purchasing power first. I cannot purchase things everywhere. That's exactly, that's what we want. Reason bad money will circulate, and the good money will be um, saved. Uh, it's exactly what we want as well. 
you want this money to circulate and revive the, uh, the economy with this multiplier effect, uh, tangent multipliers through higher velocity and transactions. Some would say it's a protectionist a currency. It's a suboptimal in view of the regard and benefits of trade. Um, but that's forgetting that uh, Ricardo himself uh, looked at the benefits of trade on average. Comparative advantages are on average good for one, um, for the partners, but they are very bad in terms of inequalities. And if you don't have the mechanisms to redistribute wealth afterwards, um, then uh, this uh, trade benefits are, are not there. And we've come to the limit of, through fiscal solutions, to redistribute wealth. So there is another way, uh, which is to work on how the money is created and how it circulates. That's um, where you can really relook at redistribution if you've come to the limits with your fiscal uh, tools. Us usual fears we discussed are that they would compete with the legal tender. Indeed, they start small. Let's see what they bring. Um, sometimes they are confused with uh, cryptocurrencies. But that's, again, a question of terminology, as uh, Helmut was putting it. Cryptocurrencies are only crypto financial assets. They have nothing. Uh, they are not currencies, and they have nothing to do with the real economy. These complementary currencies are fully backed by the real economy. Um, some would tell they prepare an exit from the, euro, uh, from the currency area uh, in the euro, and this is why we should not allow them. That was my case in, with my employer at the European Central Bank. Um, or some would say it's a return to the free banking era. So there are some good things of that area as well. Um, and finally, since they devalue my, the value of money, they may spark inflation. Well, no. Again, um, if you look at the quantitative theory of money, the idea is not to increase the prices, or the, the change in prices, but really to increase velocity, and especially if you don't have any money creation, you don't create it because you back it one-to-one -one with the legal tender currency. So to conclude, um, we have these large redistributive effects which are inherent to our current monetary system, and we should address the problem at the source in the way money circulates and is created. And we need to avoid that entire regions are falling behind in large currency areas. So remember the Midwest, remember the yellow jacket movements. And money to make it a democratic medium. Christine, I think one really fair, good way to do it in very concrete is with people like Susan Witt and uh, Alice uh, Maggio is to support the development of complementary currency. Thank you to all the participants in the panel the audience shows that it's not a very hot topic, but it's growing. Quality counts for something.